All right, good evening, everyone. So good to be with you uh, for this last study together on First Corinthians. I had mentioned to Brother Brian that uh, I'd be looking at the early chapters of First Corinthians, and we didn't make a lot of progress. We're probably not going to even make it out of the first chapter, <clears throat> but I trust it will be helpful to us at least to consider what we've thought about. <clears throat> I'd like us to begin reading, please, if we could, uh, this evening in verse 13 of uh, chapter 1, and I'm going to read down to verse 25. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 13 begins this way, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in mine own name. And I baptized also the household of Stephanus, Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block. And unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. And again, God will bless that reading from his word to us this evening. Our main theme this evening is going to be the world's wisdom versus the wisdom of God. And we're going to see that the world's wisdom is utterly bankrupt. I, I think if we ever uh, were doubted that, I think our doubts have gone. Uh, if you think recently, uh, certainly this side of the border, uh, some of the greatest legal minds in the country are incapable of defining what is a woman. And so what it's shown us is this, that the world's wisdom is utterly and totally bankrupt, bankrupt to solve the world's problems, bankrupt to, to help people in any way. It, it is utterly bankrupt. And uh, we're, we're God's wisdom, by comparison, is powerful and saving. So that's what we're going to look at. But before we do, we want to deal with some leftover business in the issue of baptism. And I want to uh, just kind of break in verse 13 again. And notice he says, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? And we've been talking last time about how uh, there was contention in the assembly in Corinth, and they were dividing into groups surrounding certain leaders who appealed to them. And so there were different parties developing in the assembly. And, and Paul used the, the names of Paul, Apollos, Cephas, and Christ, uh, we suggested that they, they may have been just names used as an example, uh, but they were dividing around individuals, individuals who uh, were their heroes, if you like, and so they were dividing up in this way. And in order to answer that, Paul asked some very pertinent questions. Is Christ divided? Because we're supposed to be one body in the cross. And so is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified? He uses himself as an example. Was Paul crucified for you? Then he says this, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Now, just a simple implication of this is this, that every one of them had been baptized. He's writing to the entire church of God, which is at Corinth, and he's asking them the question, when you were baptized, whose name were you baptized in? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? And the implication is that every one of them that was truly saved had been baptized. In fact, the New Testament would be very dogmatic about that, that, uh, that the idea of an unbaptized believer is constantly 
constantly foreign to the New Testament. When somebody got saved, invariably they got baptized. And so, of course, they weren't baptized in the name of Paul. Uh, we know from Matthew 28 that they were baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And even as they were baptized, they were identifying with not the death, burial, and resurrection of Paul, because he's writing this, he's still alive, but the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Their actual baptism itself was a public acting out of their confession of a belief that when Christ died, they died with him. When he was buried, they were buried with him. When he rose, they rose to newness of life. And so every one of them were baptized. Then he says, I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I'd baptized in mine own name, and I baptized also the household of Stephanus. And again, I just want to think about this, how uh, the key uh, personalities and leaders of the early church were reluctant to actually baptize converts. Uh, they, they would give that to someone else, and you can understand why. Even the Lord himself, if you, if you look at John's gospel, chapter 4, you'll notice that even in his public ministry, and of course, we know this is not New Testament believers' baptism. It's a different thing, uh, but it's a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Uh, but notice in John 4 and verse 1 and 2, it says, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples. And you see, they pass that responsibility on to other people. And you can see why, because you can imagine, you know, the heart of man is often very prideful. And imagine somebody uh, showing up and saying, you never guess who baptized me. Actually, it was the Lord himself. And it's almost like you could almost see them kind of kind of displaying their brownie points. It was the Lord that baptized. And then somebody else, well, well, the apostle Paul baptized me. And, and so that's the heart of man, loves to make something uh, out of who did the baptizing. And so that's why they shied away from this. And, and so Paul, uh, Peter himself as well, if you look at Acts 10, by the way, I just love this verse on baptism, uh, Acts chapter 10 and verse 48. Acts 10 verse 48, uh, notice, we'll read from verse 47, this is Cornelius' household and the gospel coming to the Gentiles. And it says this, can any man forbid water that they should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord, then prayed they him to tarry certain days. I don't say that he baptized them, but what it does say is he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. And I like that. He didn't say to them, well, I, you know, it would be a really good idea if you considered believers' baptism, now you're Christians. In fact, uh, maybe we'll have a series of, you know, several weeks where we'll do some courses, and then we'll see how you feel about it at the end of it. Actually, he commanded them to be baptized, because you cannot be a disciple of the Lord Jesus and not obey the first command right? You know, baptizing is to teach them to observe all things I have commanded you. And if, if they want to obey the first one, what makes them think they'll obey anything else the Lord commanded? And so believers' baptism is really, really important. But again, we suggest that Peter wasn't the one that did the baptizing, but he certainly commanded it. And we want to just say, why was that such an important thing that they didn't do it? For two reasons. One, it avoided the, the picture of clericalism, that only, you know, kind of official church dignitaries can do the baptizing. And then it also avoided the evil of sectarianism, so that people could say, well, I'm one of Peter's Baptist uh, men, you see. I'm one of Paul's men he baptized. And so they, they were very reluctant to do the baptizing. They passed it on to others. And Paul, of course, because he's starting the work, you've got to do someone initially because there's no one else to do it. So he started the work in Corinth. And so he, he did baptize uh, initially. 
but as soon as there were others capable of doing it, they did it. So he says, uh, I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius. Now, I just want to mention Gaius for a moment. We know who Crispus was, the chief ruler of the synagogue who had been converted in Acts chapter 18. But look at Romans 16 for a moment and verse 23. He says, Gaius, mine host, and of the whole church, saluteth you. Erastus, the chamberlain of the city, saluteth you, and Quartus, a brother. And of course, Paul is writing to the Corinthians, uh, or to the Romans, should I say, from Corinth. And so where was he staying in Corinth? He was staying in the house of Gaius church so the whole corinthian assembly met in the house of gaius and so that's uh, an interesting person uh, house uh, his house obviously had some measure of wealth uh, to be able to have the entire assembly meeting in his home but it certainly did and so uh, he was baptized by paul and then he says um, and i baptized also the household of stephanus and again, another interesting family and another interesting issue about baptism, because three times in the word of God, we read of households being baptized and people have from this drawn some wrong inferences. Uh, they've inferred that if the household was baptized, well, obviously there was a cute little baby in the house, and then there were a few toddlers in the house as well. And so from that, they have jumped to the idea that uh, it includes the baptism of infants who are not yet saved, but with the belief that they're covenant children who will one day get saved. And uh, we want to examine that just for a minute, because it, it, while we're in Corinthians, these are things that are worthy of our consideration. And so I want us just to look at the three incidents that we have recorded in the word of God, where it speaks of households being baptized. And the first one, uh, Acts 16, it's the uh, household of Lydia. And we noticed that she was a, a successful businesswoman uh, and uh, a seller of purple, fine linen, all the rest of it. And it says in verse 15, it says, and when she was baptized and her household, she besought us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and abide there. And she constrained us. And so that is the house uh, of Lydia. And then look further down the chapter in verse 33, you have another household, and that's the household of the Philippian jailer. And so it says in verse uh, 33, it says, he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God, with all his house. And then the third household is the household of Stephanus that are mentioned in verse 16 of chapter one. Now, what we know about that household of Stephanus from elsewhere is that they, they as a family addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. And uh, <clears throat> we, in fact, we, we know that from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 16 we just want to look there to see that as he talks about them he says in verse 15 i beseech you brethren you know the house of stephanus that is the first fruits of achaia and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints by the way that's one of the the most positive addictions in the whole of the word of God. When we usually think of the word addiction, we tend to think of it in negative terms. Oh, this guy's addicted to this or he's addicted to that. But oh, wouldn't, wouldn't it be wonderful if there were more people like the household of Stephanus who are, are addicted to the ministry of the saints, to ministering to the people of God. Oh, what a blessing that would be if we had more people addicted to that thing. And so just want to kind of pull these thoughts together for a minute as we've considered these different households. The jailer's household, we're told, rejoice, even in God with all his house. 
Stephanus, his house, addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. And so there are certain qualities that are mentioned here. Uh, there's, there's faith. They, they were believing. There's joy. There's ministry. All of these things require a measure of intelligence, right? A, a, an understanding uh, to be able to do those things. And so it would show that the inference that they were uh, children there or babies there is just a total false inference. These households were addicted to the ministry of the saints. They believed rejoicing uh, with all their house. And, and so it would seem to me that it's just a fallacy uh, to put the idea of infants into this picture. So then we, we move on having uh, had that little kind of uh, sidetrack on baptism. We want to think about this next section from verse 17 onwards. And from verse 17, really to the end of the chapter, we're going to see the word wisdom is mentioned eight times and wise is mentioned four times. And then if you go on into chapter two, you'll find again, wisdom is mentioned a further eight times, seven of them actually in the original text, one of them is supplied in italics uh, in the King James Version in verse seven. But nevertheless, uh, it's the dominant idea of these next two sections uh, in the rest of chapter one, right into chapter two. And of course, it, it really is a very important issue because the Corinthians, very much like their companions in Athens, were people who loved wisdom. And they, they, they thought it was an amazing thing and they were, they were enamored with wisdom. And, and, and so, uh, it was this kind of philosophical wisdom of the world that captivated them. And so he wants to deal with that issue and, and show quite clearly that actually the wisdom of the world is totally foolishness. And actually God's wisdom is totally different to the wisdom of the world. And so that's the section we want to uh, jump into for, for our final session tonight. So it says, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. I've already said Paul recognized it was important because he practiced it, right? Initially, when people were saved, when he started in the assembly, he baptized the first converts. So he's not saying it's not an important issue, but he says he didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. His primary purpose was preaching the gospel. And again, this is a very helpful verse when you're dealing with people like the Church of Christ who see that baptism is essential to the gospel. I believe baptism is essential to obedience, but it's not essential to salvation. And so uh, he says, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, to, to evangelize. That's the, the word that's used there, the word preach. Uh, it, it's the uh, word evangelisco, it, to make the gospel known by all available means. And so Paul recognized that was his commission, to make the gospel known by all available means to men uh, everywhere, this gospel message. And he says, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of non-effect. Not with this rhetorical displays and philosophical style that was so captivating to the Athenians and the Greeks of that day. No, he, he preached the cross of Christ, which is, again, so contrary to, to man's thinking, man's ideas, man's wisdom. And so it wasn't with kind of an, an external exhibition of, of, of clever rhetoric, but it was actually a, a power that is inherent in the gospel itself. And so he preached the message of the gospel, not the wisdom of the words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. And of course, the cross describes the death of Christ in its extreme depth of humiliation. Uh, in contrast to the natural ideas of man's wisdom, this, this was totally turned the whole thing on its head. Uh, this was totally different to, to how men saw things. And in fact, it was so humiliating that Roman citizens 
were not allowed to be crucified because it was considered to be beneath the dignity of a Roman to suffer such a horrific death. That was for uh, their conquered uh, kind of uh, enemies. It wasn't for Romans. It was certainly considered beneath the dig dignity. Yet God chose this, this despised thing to be the core of his revelation. Uh, th this is what all of the scripture, the divine revelation is leading to, is the crucifixion of the Son of God. And, and the world, uh, well, that was just totally different to how they conceived of things, how they understood things. The cross had a tremendous stigma attached to it in Paul's day. Of course, it was a, a place of execution. It was a despised place. And when you think of it, like this message that is, Paul is preaching throughout the, the very glorious Roman Empire was a message of a Jewish rabbi dying on a piece of wood in a nondescript hill <laughs> uh, that we, we call Calvary. Uh, and um, in, in a part of the world that was kind of considered a backwater, and, and this very message, the eternal destiny of all men that ever live is dependent on how they respond to this message. This is this. The world just sees this as absolute folly. In fact, you know, this week we're talking about the wisdom of this world, but I'm, I'm not sure if you're keeping up on what's going on. But there's uh, the Davos uh, thing going on right now. Uh, and of course, it's the World Economic forum and it's all the elites of the world are coming together to solve the world's problems and here they are this is the wisdom of the world brought together in one place all flying in in their private jets all the rest of it and you know what's interesting is that they're going to try and solve the world's problems and i guarantee that the cross of christ will not be one of the suggestions that come up on the table of discussion <laughs> i'm certain it won't be and yet here's the interesting thing. They're concerned about the climate. I wonder, I just wonder if part of the tumult in our world is because of man's sin, not because of carbon usage and uh, my carbon footprint, but because of man's sin. Because doesn't it say that the whole creation is groaning and travailing? Now, why is creation groaning and travailing? It's because of Adam's sin, right? Sin caused the world to groan and travail. Why did the land of Israel vomit out its inhabitants, the Canaanites? Remember that? It says the land itself vomits them out. Wasn't it because of their sin that did it? I mean, if we want to solve the climate problem, I think we've got to preach the gospel. That's, this, that's how the, the climate problem will be solved, is when man repents of his wickedness. It's no wonder we're in such climate upheaval when, at least my side of the border, we have, we have murdered 63 million children on the altar to Moloch uh, to, to, to satisfy the American dream. 63 million. Is there any wonder creation is in upheaval? But... The world's elites, they're not going to discuss that. And but yet God says, This this is my solution to solve the world's problems. It's it's that despised place called Calvary. And it's based, the wisdom of God is be based on divine revelation, and it centers at the cross, where the wisdom of the world is based on human reasoning and has no room for the cross and as christians we're also warned colossians 2 8 beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy that greek philosophy it means love of wisdom love of worldly wisdom do not be spoiled don't let anybody corrupt you from the simplicity that's in christ and i believe that worldly wisdom worldly philosophy is able to corrupt the church of god and has corrupted it in times past i believe that a lot of the mess in contemporary christianity goes back to men like augustine and even thomas aquinas trying to merge the philosophical ideas of the world with the revelation of god and it's always disastrous 
And so we need to recognize these things are against each other. Philosoph philosophy provided a view invented by man of the meaning of life, the values, the relationships, the purpose, the destiny, various schools of philosophy rose up each with different views, but ignoring divine revelation. And so they're trying to come up with their answers to the world and why it is like it is, but they're ignoring the divine revelation altogether. And there's no absolute standard of truth. No right and wrong is, is not based on a divine revelation. It's based on human opinion and it's constantly shifting. And the Corinthians, like those in Athens, were enamored with these various schools of philosophy. And as I said, when, they, when you add that to Christianity, it's a lethal mixture. It's a terrible thing. And so it didn't, I mean, these philosophies, philosophies didn't help them when they were unbelievers, and it's certainly not helping them now that they have believed. And certainly today we can see that modern man, again, is just enamored with the philosophies, the wisdoms of the world, rather than the re revelation of God that centers in the cross. So he says in verse 18, for the preaching of the cross, is to them that perish foolishness, but to us which are saved, it is the power of God. First thing I want to say is that the preaching of the cross divides men. That's what this verse is saying. It, it's dividing the human race. If you preach the cross, it's always going to divide. It will divide men. And it'll divide men into two groups, the them and the us. Notice what he says. The preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness but to us that are saved it is the power of god and and it does divide it, it divides families the lord jesus said uh, i've come uh, to to divide uh, father against mother and it's true the gospel does divide it, it really does um some of us have experienced that some of us have experienced family rejection and the reason we experienced it was because we embraced the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in embracing the gospel, we rejected the, the religion of our forebears, and it brought division. And so he says, preaching the cross, it, it, it's a message that will divide. To them that perish, and they're perishing uh, every single day because they think this message is foolishness. But to us, <laughs> those that are saved, Oh, it's the transforming power of God that has changed our lives and changed our eternal destiny and changed our perspective on everything. This message has radically transformed us. And so he wants us to know that preaching the cross, it certainly is a message that divides men. And, it, you know, in one sense, the preaching of the cross it reveals the world for what it is, in a sense, the wisdom of the world. It, it, it shows it up for what it is. It's interesting that when the Lord Jesus was crucified, Pontius Pilate had written the inscription, which was written on the cross, and he had it written in Hebrew and Latin in Greek. And, of course, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. And of course, that really caused great irritation uh, to the religious leaders of the day. Uh, no, you should say that he calls himself the king of the, no, what I've written, I have written. But interesting that the three languages that that was written in, in a sense, summarizes the world's attitude towards the son of God. See, it was written in Hebrew. In Hebrew, uh, was the language of the religious world, wasn't it? The Jewish world was the religion par excellence, as it were. It was even given by God. And so written in Hebrew. And so it showed the antagonism of worldly religion to the Son of God. And then it was written in Latin. Uh, that was the symbol of political power, the language of the political power of the day, the Roman Empire, right? This is the language of Rome, the great power. And of course, it shows that the, the folly of Roman justice, 
this great political power and they proclaimed a man innocent. I can find no fault in this man. And then the next breath, take him away and crucify him. So much as it were for Roman justice and for this great power and the wisdom so-called of this great power, political power. And then Greek, well, that was the cultured language, the cultured world of the Greeks. And again, it would show that the cultured world, what does the cultured world think of the cross of Christ? How popular do you think the world of the arts and the world of culture, the cross of Christ really is? Uh, I suspect that it, it's not discussed at some of their gatherings, or, or if it is, it's with absolute disdain. All had a hand in the execution of the son of God, the son of his love. This is the wisdom of the world. And yet that same place, the cross, this center of God's wisdom, it reveals the world for what it is. It's hostility, it's antagonism towards God, but it also is a place where it demonstrates to the world what God is. It shows to us God's love for the world that he gave his only son. It shows God's justice, that he hates sin and it must be dealt with. It shows God's holiness. I mean, it demonstrates so many things to us about God, uh, how marvelous the cross of Christ is. <clears throat> that same message, as we mentioned, when it was preached, it brought forth different responses. It divided people into a them group and an us group. To them, foolishness, to us, the power of God. And so they said it was foolishness. The word in Greek is Mariah, from which we get our English word moron. And what they basically said was, this message of a crucified Savior, we think it is moronic. Okay? It's, it's just insane. It's, it's crazy. They had no respect for it. They thought it was a moronic message. And of course, as a result of that, throughout all eternity, throughout all eternity, they will live to regret their foolishness in rejecting that message. And yet, for those of us that are saved, for all eternity, we'll be so grateful that we believe that message. So, he says in verse 19, for it's written... I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. So he wants us to know that this preaching of the cross, not only does it divide men, it was determined beforehand. You see, it's written. It, it's not, not, it's been part of God's plan throughout the ages. And of course, here, it's a direct quotation from Isaiah's prophecy in chapter 29, Isaiah chapter 29 and verse 14. Isaiah 29, verse 14, it says, Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder, for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. And so in the original context in Isaiah 29, uh, it, it's, it's when Sennacherib, the Assyrian, uh, comes up to besiege Jerusalem. It was during the reign of godly King Hezekiah. And conventional political wisdom of the day would have made a political alliance with Egypt so that the Assyrians could be sent away. That's how they would have operated. That was the conventional wisdom of the world. And yet Hezekiah did something totally different. He went to the Lord, spread it before the Lord, and just depended on him. And the Lord showed that he is dependable because that very night, 185,000 crack Assyrian troops were killed in one night by the angel and so again it shows that <clears throat> these schemes and alliances and worldly ideas of men the conventional wisdom didn't work but god's way demonstrated his power in a marvelous marvelous way and so 
who preached across determined beforehand. God has said, I'm going to destroy the wisdom of the wild. It was determined actually before the world began that this lamb would be slain. And so it was determined beforehand, this preaching of the cross. It also destroys human wisdom. Verse 20, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where's the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? And God constantly does that. That's one of the things I love about studying the Bible is how God constantly shows his ways are so different to the ways of the world. And he constantly shows up the wisdom of the world to be foolishness all the way through the, the scriptures. It's marvelous to behold. And again, once more, we have a quotation from the Old Testament here in verse 20, when it talks about the scribe, where's the scribe, where's the dispute of this world. And again, back in Isaiah, if we go back to Isaiah chapter 19, Isaiah chapter 19 in verse 12 it says where are they where are the wise men and let them tell thee now and let them know what the lord of hosts hath purposed uh, upon egypt and so again where where are the wise and again it's in connection with uh, the the folly of trusting in Egypt and the world and its ways rather than trusting in the Lord because it really never worked out well for Israel when they trusted in Egypt. And then there's another quotation as well in Isaiah 33, verse 18. Isaiah 33, verse 18. Where we read, Thine heart shall meditate terror. Where is the scribe? Where is the receiver? Where is he that counted the towers? And of course, the context here was that the Assyrians were so certain that they were going to defeat Hezekiah that they'd already sent scribes there to Jerusalem, getting ready to go and record all the booty that they were going to carry away and all the, uh, the treasures. And of course, they never, ever got to begin to make their lists of the treasures because God defeated them by a man that simply trusted in him and his way rather than in the folly and the wisdom of the world. And so the preaching of the cross destroys human wisdom, always brings to nothing the wisdom of the world. And then the preaching of the cross, verse 21, it delivers salvation. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Worldly wisdom could never find out God. The wisdom, after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. Let's just go to Romans chapter one. Very familiar words to us, but it just shows that actually the wisdom of men usually takes them away from God, not towards God. And we, we, we see in this very well-known passage in Romans, it says in verse 21, because when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Then notice this verse 22, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God to an image made like to corruptible man, to birds, four-footed bees, creeping things, wherefore God also gave them up. And we know the rest of the story. But again, what does human wisdom do? <laughs> well, it doesn't find out God. In fact, it turns its back on God. Human wisdom thinks it's superior to God. And so it tells us that professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. You know, I, I don't know about you, but the more I see what's going on in our contemporary world, the more evident it is to me every single day how much foolishness there is in the so-called intelligentsia of our world, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Sometimes I'll 
theories are coming out of universities and all this kind of stuff. And you think to yourself, what are these guys thinking? It's just insanity, the stuff they're coming out with. And, and yet it's what God says. They're, when you turn your back on God, when you turn your back on divine revelation, you are going to descend into an insanity that is seen in the so-called wisdom of this world. And so he tells us, after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. And then how wonderful this is. It pleased God. It, it was God's good pleasure by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Isn't that beautiful? God's good pleasure. See, he's, he has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Scripture is clear. He has no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but it's God's good pleasure to save them that believe. And how does he save them that believe? It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching. The foolishness of this word preaching. And it's interesting, the word preaching, it's the word caruso. It's used 61 times. And it's the idea of a public declaration by a herald. It was very common uh, in the Roman Empire to have an imperial, before the days of Twitter and Facebook and all this kind of stuff, if there was a message from the president or from the emperor, he didn't tweet his message. He sent his imperial herald and the imperial heralds went throughout the empire and they would be like a town crier and they would proclaim the message from, with all the authority of the emperor, emperor behind them, they would give the message. And what God says is, it's his particular pleasure to it. He saves men through the proclamation as a herald of the cross, the message of the cross. And beloved, if we really want to see revival, we've got to get back to the preaching of the old, old gospel. Every time there's been revival, there's been, there's been two things that have been prominent in revivals a return to prayer and a return to powerful gospel preaching. Every revival would have those two things that would be common denominators in every one. And so he says, if after the, that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom, you not got it, please God. It was his good pleasure by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. And even though the Jews require a sign, the Greeks seek after wisdom. He says, we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block, to the Greeks foolishness, but to them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom God of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. I wonder, do we really believe that? Do we really believe it? Because if we did, we'd be out proclaiming this message more fervently and more passionately than ever. That it's God's good pleasure to save sinners through the preaching of the old, old cross. And it's a marvelous thing. And if you, again, if you look back to your own salvation, ask yourself, how did it occur? What happened? It was that marvelous, marvelous message of a crucified Savior lift it up you seeing your need you seeing your sin and then looking in faith to the uplifted savior and a miracle occurred in your life you pass from death to a new creature in christ and it was the fact that it was god's good pleasure through the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe and so brethren in these days where the wisdom of the world has never been more foolish, <laughs> more evidently foolish. It's always been foolish, but it's so obvious now to anybody that is watching and listening. Here, it's a chance for us to give the wisdom of God, which is based on divine revelation and centers in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that wisdom of God is able to save through that preaching of the cross. Brethren, this is what we need to be about. 
while we still have chance, while we still have breath, let us preach this glorious gospel. To his name be glory. Let's pray. Our Father, we're thankful for this epistle written so long ago and yet so very up to date. Oh Lord, we see our world here just like the world of Corinth, enamored with men's philosophical ideas that are so complicated and so confusing and even deadly when they're added, especially added to the simplicity of Christianity, uh, they become a deadly poison. Lord, deliver us from being corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Lord, take us back to the simple roots of Christ and him crucified and preaching that old, old story with new dependence upon thee to work in these last days. And so, Lord, we look to thee to use us to be heralds, imperial heralds of the most marvelous, life-changing message the world has ever known, the preaching of Christ and him crucified. We'll give you the glory. In Jesus' name. Amen.